Okay, here we are, and it's Monday, and every so often we do Midnight in Brussels, where we catch up with Gauri Kandakar. And if you didn't know already, she is the Deputy Director and the Director of Europe for Global Relations Forum. And she is also the Senior Think Tech European Correspondent. So, welcome again to the show, Gauri. Thank you, Jay. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, great to have you on. So, we're calling this Updates Across Europe. And we have a lot to talk about, but I think the first thing we should talk about is this uh, event you were working on, which took place a few weeks ago. And uh, I want to I want to hear everything. You worked very hard on that. What was it? Yes. Well, basically, we did an event for the European Union delegation to India, uh, and the event was an urbanization, sustainable urbanization, and it's one of my suggestions, which. The EU and India picked up actually to create a forum, a partnership on urbanization. Mm -hmm. So we were very excited. This event was the first in my hometown of Pune, which is a city next to Bombay in the west of India. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also where my think tank is headquartered. So I'm from speaking from the Brussels office. Uh, and, and it was a great event. We had so many people talking about urbanization and you could really feel the energy, the optimism in India. It's absolutely palpable and we will speak on how um, both Europe and India could cooperate in building smart cities which is the new big thing in India it's Narendra Modi the Prime Minister's pet project ah. so it was great it was great absolutely smart cities so I mean how far advanced is India on smart cities we think about smart cities all the time what does it mean in India and how far along the, the trail are you Actually, nobody knows what smart cities mean, you know. <laughs> Neither in India nor in Europe and nowhere. There's no single definition of a smart city. I think, um, to make it really simple, a smart city is uh, a city which sustainably uh, fulfills the needs of people, be it business, uh, you know, day-to-day -day essentials, water, less traffic. And mm -hmm. all of that, I think that these are all components of smart cities. But what India is doing now is that uh, each city is coming up with projects which would make them smarter or do things better. Uh -huh. So this is the approach that they're taking. But there's no nationally adopted definition. Yeah, I think you're right about that. But I'd like to add one thought that is, that is not intuitive. And that is that smart cities include public places which are not necessarily smart on the intel intellectual level or on the technological level, but on the people level. Um, public places yeah. are where the people live together, you know, and we, in, in the yeah. nuclear age, you know, we tend to live by ourselves, we live in little silos, and then we go to work. And when we yeah. go to work, we cross public spaces, and we have our public lives out there in, in gatherings and so forth. And those are the spaces that make cities livable, you know? True. I agree. Well, if it were up to me, Honolulu would be the best definition of a smart city, but, well, not everybody can uh, reach, I think that's paradise city, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think in years to come, there'll be more talk about it, architects and engineers yeah. and city planners and political officials. You know, I think there'll come a time, don't you, when political, political officials have to go to school. They must go to school. They can't yeah. serve in their office until they go to school and learn how to serve in their office. And then we'll have more smart, smart cities. I think we should also speak about a partnership between Hawaii and India. There, there <laughs> you go. We can work on. Then I'll get a chance to see you more often. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I got a, I got a tail end of a cold here, but I, I do want to move on to uh, my experience. Now, you put a program on, and I went to Portugal. And um, Portugal is obviously near Spain. And yeah. while, I'm, uh, while I'm knocking around in Portugal, I'm reading a book called The Terror Years by a film named Michael White, which is a bestseller now. White, White is a, um, a journalist, and he writes about uh, the, the people who created uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, largely uh, the same group who ultimately created uh, uh, ISIS. And he talks about where they came from, where they went, their life experiences, and how they came together. And one of the things I thought was interesting was uh, the fact that they had a, a significant presence in Spain. And there was a, a, train, a train episode a few years ago uh, with a bombing uh, in, the, in the metro. I think it was in Madrid. You know, 
March yes. 11th, they call it, March 11th. A very, very serious. There was a, a fair amount of loss of life there and all. Yes. And it demonstrated that, um, you know, these terror groups do have a presence in Spain. Spain has not escaped, uh, you know, the trouble in Europe. Um, no. Portugal, however, has. Portugal, for some reason, is outside, you know, the range of that activity. And I therefore felt that it was relatively safe to go to Portugal. Uh, so uh, I spent uh, a couple of weeks in Lisbon, and I found it quite delightful. And I urge you to try it out. The food is out of this world. The people yes. are friendly. Uh, there's immigration from everywhere, like in the rest of Europe. Um, and the museums and public, uh, public spaces, if you will, uh, were really beautiful. Uh, Portugal is a little behind things. I would put it 20, 30 years behind the rest of Europe, you know, in terms of the development of infrastructure and technology, but it is a lovely place. Maybe it's good for that reason, you know, that it's behind. Um, so that's my suggestion to you, Gary. Wonderful. It's absolutely beautiful, and I can't wait to go there. In every, almost every other Saturday, I, um, I try to eat Portuguese food because there's a huge Portuguese community living in Brussels. Ah. And the food is delicious. I mean, you feel great and you feel nice. And uh, even if there's no sun, you feel happier. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, you know, it's like, uh, it's like the, old, uh, the language from the old country. Namely, the Spanish do not understand Portuguese, but the Portuguese understand Spanish. And so they feel they have, an, they have an advantage on the rest of Europe because nobody understands Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> I can vouch for that. <laughs> the re the re remarkable thing about Portugal is that it had one century, maybe two, of uh, fantastic uh, exploration, beginning in the latter part of the, uh, what, the 15th century. Um, and while Columbus was knocking around in the Caribbean, they were also traveling and discovering things, and they discovered a good part of South America, especially including Brazil. They discovered they went north as far as Nova Scotia, and they discovered Nova Scotia. They discovered West Africa, a number of places and colonies they had in West Africa. They discovered India, um, the Goa, as I recall. Um, they discovered yeah. Macau, we know that. They discovered, and, and China for that matter, and they discovered Japan in 1537. They were the most active discoverers that had yet been on the planet. And what yes. is so interesting is they, they lost most of their colonies early on um, because, uh, you know, I guess they couldn't cope with the Spanish. They couldn't cope with the Dutch, Dutch. They couldn't ultimately cope with the English. And because they had a very damaging earthquake in the year 1755, which destroyed a good, a good part of Lisbon. Um, that taken all together, they, they lost their advantage. And now they're, uh, they, they revel in historic glory. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very interesting, though. Yeah. Anyway, I want to take you to Brexit for a minute. We have seen a yes. lot um, of news about uh, Prime Minister May. Uh, yes. Prime Minister May seems to be doing exactly what she said when she took office. She's pushing for an early Brexit, however wise or unwise that may be. What's the story? What's the story, Gary? Yes. Uh, Brexit chaos continues here, and the biggest biggest sign is the um, the fall of the pound, which I'm sure you know many American travelers are very happy about. But the pound is now equal to the euro, mm. which is incredibly shocking, uh, and it's basically signaling a collapse of the economy. And because of that. Um, this week, there's been utter chaos in the UK and it's really impacted people on the ground is because uh, British products, some very traditionally British products like Marmite, which I don't think many of you all know, but it's a very funny tasting kind of spread that you put on bread. Mm -hmm. And that was unavailable because uh, the companies which produce it uh, wanted to charge a surplus because of the fall in the pound. And these are European companies, uh, basically Unilever. And so Unilever said, we will charge a surcharge, otherwise we can't sell. <laughs> and so these products were unavailable. And then these are traditional, traditional products, which cause utter chaos. Um, but about me, uh, so Theresa May has been a bit shocking for all of us, I think, uh, especially in the policy circles, because... Um, She's come across as completely authoritarian. Um, 
far worse than you know the kind of more <coughs> agenda that the Tories had mm-hmm. taken forward. Even though they're not liberals, you know, they're not the liberals. Um, but um, she had supported the Remain campaign, so she was opposed to Brexit. Uh, when she took office, um, she herself came about with the notion to have a hard Brexit. Now, a hard Brexit would be the most damaging concept you could imagine to basically extract the UK out like a tooth from the European Union, which, you know, extractions are never pleasant. That's traumatic uh, is what. Exactly. Traumatic, highly traumatic. Uh, and they would destroy the economy of the UK in particular, not Europe, because these are already integrated economies. Uh, and the larger part of the European economy remains. So the UK economy. So she's playing more to a populist notion, you know, um, a crowd pleaser, let's say. And she's like, okay, the people want Brexit. Let me give them Brexit. Let me give it to them as, as soon as possible. Because she's an interim prime minister. She's not an elected official. So mm. she would have to, uh, so she's aiming more for the elections. So if she goes for this hard Brexit, which she thinks would, of course, be a crowd pleaser and which nobody yet knows what hard Brexit is. Nobody still knows what Brexit is, actually. Mm. Is it pulling out of the European Union or, you know, will the UK remain in the single market? And the single market is basically the goods, free goods, free services, free people movement area. Um, What what justification does she use to jump from one side opposing Brexit now, not only to supporting Brexit, but to wanting it to be immediate and hard. I mean, what, what rationale could she give for that change of heart? <coughs> Excuse me. So basically, um, she's not given any, which is the shocking part, basically. But what she said at the um, uh, Tories conference uh, that took place, the Conservative Party conference that took place um, this month, earlier this month, was that um, anybody who uh, questions Brexit is questioning the intelligence of the British people, basically, which was utterly shocking. And, you know, um, she's just playing to populist tendencies and she's moving in that direction. So it's truly obvious that it's a complete farce and it's really aimed at elections and their own political survival, which, by the way, uh, is supported by the fact which was revealed this week that Boris Johnson, who you know, you've been seeing him as the face, one of the faces of Brexit, uh, who's campaigned for the Leave campaign. But he had penned uh, an op ed which was to be published, and that was in favor of Remain. So basically, he tossed a coin saying which op ed would be better for his career oh. and so he chose the the leave campaign uh, and this is the reality now the biggest biggest stress now is that people are challenging Theresa May and they are saying that okay one is this is constitutionally incorrect she's not allowed to take decisions as an interim prime minister yeah but also because she's using old monarchy rules yeah 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 and the, the other thing is that um, they're saying that her mandate is not, nobody, the referendum does not give her a mandate to pull the UK out of the single market. And now what is happening and was the big thing to see is that Nicola Sturgeon, who's the Scottish leader, is has said that there will be a second Scottish referendum. Because they're so unhappy with the Brexit. Yeah, because, you know, more than 90% of Scotland voted to remain in the EU. And uh, basically, when the referendum had happened in Scotland, the British people had told, British politicians went to Scotland and they said that, oh, but if you leave, you will have to leave the European Union because the UK is a member. And independent Scotland will not be a member of the EU. And so, uh, basically, the Scots voted to remain in the UK to remain in the EU. Yeah. And now that this is off the table, yeah. so they think that, you know, a we'll referendum back to the is EU. Yeah. 
exactly. So you know what? What's really troublesome about this is that the the damage is happening and will continue to happen. I mean, I, what I hear you saying is they're in for a bad time. They're in for an, an eco economic meltdown because of this. Is not too much, and she's making it worse. And there's not not too much they can do to avoid that. Um, yeah. She, I mean, the UK is in real trouble. And, and then on top of that, Scotland wants to go away again. Um, gee whiz, this is not good for Britain at all, is it? No, 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 no. I mean, and the worst is that uh, this is all self-inflicted. This was all self-inflicted by politicians looking for political gains. Uh, David Cameron had no business in offering this election in and out question to the broader public. Mm -hmm. Because most of them have absolutely voted not for the topic, but for their discontentment with various issues, which is now a global trend in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and this was not supposed to be offered anyways, but now uh, the UK economy is in complete shambles. The EU's existing trade agreements are in question because the scope is going to change. The market is no longer going to be the same. Yeah. Uh, and, and the UK economy is totally dependent on the EU. Uh, for you know more than seventy percent of its trade, so. But they, but the EU, uh, but the UK has strong uh, trade relations with the US, and um, I, what I understand is that they are looking to the US to help them out, and and they're finding a certain amount of resonance on that, and there are people in the government here want to help them out. But my question to you, this is a hard question, Gary. Yes. Can the US save the UK? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Even if you wanted to. And I'll explain why. Because, you know, this is actually one of my favorite questions because I do work a lot on trade. And so for the moment, um, inside the European Union, uh, trade is done amongst EU member states. So they're basically the closest and around 70% of European or 80% of European trade is internal. A small percentage is external. Right? So the majority of member state trade is amongst member states, EU member states. Mm -hmm. Now, there is this TTIP, the uh, Trans-Atlantic uh, Trade and Investment Partnership, so basically an FTA that was being negotiated between the European Union and the US. That has been paused and that is not going to go anywhere. Ooh. I mean, for, yeah, it, it has been paused. So anyways, this trade deal is now off the table. Uh, for the foreseeable future, of course. Um, I have always been of, of the opinion that it was not needed because trade, US is the EU's largest external trade partner mm -hmm. and investments are to the tune of 3 trillion and more. So you don't need an FTA because trade is highly liberalized. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not in the US's interest anyways to have to negotiate a free trade agreement with the UK mm -hmm. because the UK is now small and the US is looking for huge markets in Asia so it's you have the T TPP the Trans-Pacific Partnership which has a mega market many countries and that's the trend the US is going for big issue big issue yeah yeah <laughs> uh, certainly an issue in the campaign <clears throat> well okay let's uh, let's move on to a uh, second topic um, to talk about uh, the refugees and terror, and certainly uh, there is a connection. You know, as, as much as we would like to deny the connection or minimize it, I inevitably it comes up again and again. There's a connection between refugees and terror. What, what, what is the paper saying these days? What is happening in Europe and uh, in the hotbed countries in Europe? Well, basically one of the most recent uh, terror uh, incidences, let's say, happen in Germany once again, where you had a Syrian refugee uh, in a small German town who uh, uh, who was planning to blow up another airport. So he had enough explosives, and um, uh, so it's a Syrian refugee, a male, young male uh, gentleman, um, and the German police got uh, knowledge of this plan. Um, they went to where he was staying. And they found the explosives and they were on the lookout for him. Two days later, some other Syrian refugees um, uh, basically um, 
showed the Germans where he was hiding. So they linked the Germans to the German police to him, mm -hmm. uh, and he was found and he was imprisoned and he was kept in jail, mm -hmm. where he unfortunately suicided by um, with his T-shirt basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there is the link, of course, um, largely, largely terror attacks in Europe take place uh, um, and they're caused by Europeans. So basically, um, uh, people from the Muslim background, uh, this is the trend now, Islamic terrorism as a trend. But people from who say they are Muslim, you know, the whole debate is whether they are, they're not, okay. But <laughs> it's uh, radical Islamist terrorism. And these are like second, third, fourth generation of immigrants. So they can well, identify themselves yeah. with Europe and the culture. So yeah. it's mainly those. Growingly, there's a trend of uh, ISIS extremists coming into Europe because, of course, um, there's trouble in Syria now, you know. Uh, ISIS is being expelled from Iraq. And as we speak, there's a battle in Mosul uh, and as well Aleppo. So... Um, there are a lot of them coming over, I guess. Yeah. And, and it uh, destabilizes everything. In fact, I was going to ask you about the political reaction to this, whether it's, uh, you know, long-term residents of uh, Europe or whether they have just arrived recently from the Middle East. Um, fact is, it has a political effect on the parties, on, um, you know, the political officials who would take other positions if this was not happening. Uh, you know, the, the kindness and gentleness that um, Angela Merkel was showing uh, a year or two ago um, is now being attacked by, uh, yes. by in, you know, in political circles. So where, where is it going? Uh, how is this going to wind up? Are we going to see all of Europe shift to the right? Well, the trend is there. Um even Angela Merkel recently had admitted that she was wrong with the refugee policy. At some point just before that, she said that if she had to, she would do it all over again. But she has to face elections again. She wants to get elected for a fourth time. <laughs> but I just don't see um, it happening. Now, there's a huge discussion on how the liberals have left a lot of people behind in Europe. Um, the trend to liberal, uh, liberalism has left a lot in its wake and I think you see the same effects in the US, I, uh, I mm, believe. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the support for Trump. Yes, and social democrats need to reinvent themselves in Europe at the moment mm -hmm. um, because, you know, that's the basic ideology that has um, designed Europe, you know, governed it for the past few decades. Mm -hmm. um, and social democrats need to uh, come up with a lot of solutions to a lot of hard questions uh, and people are no longer identifying themselves with the current situation, you know. Mm -hmm. so it's a drastic shift. It's a disruptive shift, let's say. Mm -hmm. What about the terrorism itself? You know, one, one uh, uh, line of thinking has been that because ISIS is not doing all that well in holding territory, for example, the Mosul battle, as you mentioned, is going on as we speak. They may, they may, ISIS may lose that battle. I mean, chances are that it will lose that battle, um, and that makes its, um, you know, its efforts in the Middle East, um, you know, less successful, of course. And and the the line of thinking is that to the extent that uh, ISIS is uh, loses ground in the Middle East, it will try harder to generate terror in Europe. Um, that that will be the focus of its efforts going forward. Um, how do people feel about that? What's the press saying about that? And is it being realized? Is there uh, an increase in the amount of terrorism that you see? Oh, of course. Of course. And I'll give you examples as well. So yesterday, I believe, um, no, last Friday, I was sitting out on my balcony and I saw uh, the bomb squad car, which was written, um, it was marked in Flemish <laughs> bomb. Uh, and then... Um, it just passed below my house and it was going uh, a kilometer away basically because there was a bomb threat. And this is a daily occurrence. So mm -hmm. when I kind of um, searched Twitter to find out what was happening, because that's literally the quickest place to find out what's happening. And I saw so many events just in Brussels each day, either a stabbing, 
either you know a school being evacuated because of a threat oh. uh, or similar you know some package found and the whole station had to be evacuated yeah. and this is a daily occurrence now we've also been seeing the military on the streets and i think that's a phenomenon across europe at the moment oh. uh, of most countries that's so too uh, bad that's really too bad because whether whether they were real threats or not maybe they're just uh, you know paranoid reactions to things but it destabilizes people and it, it pushes them to the right and it look it you know it's it it finds repression doesn't it it does and i mean just the fact that you said that you went to portugal because it you thought it was safer yeah. from spain i mean it shows the shift right i mean whoever thought spain would be a dangerous country you know okay you have the bull fights and the running of the bulls but you know it was never a dangerous country yeah, yeah, uh, over the past two years i mean you know i worked for a company that was a think tank which was headquartered in madrid and i was working there for five years uh, and it was so safe you know despite the 2003 M madrid um, metro bombing completely safe now People have to think twice about going to Europe because it might not be safe. Oh, absolutely. I can tell you that. That's true. And they try to find ways to go to Europe that, you know, skirt the threat. But let me, uh, let me go to, uh, you know, one thing that I experienced in Portugal. Uh, it was funny. I, I would ask people in Portugal whether they were going to vote for Trump or Clinton. You know, <laughs> it sounds like a joke because obviously they can't vote in an American election. But they are yeah. so invested. Yes, and I yes. bet you the same thing is all over Europe. You may not vote, but you, you vote mentally. You vote. Yes. And I would, I would, and uh, by the way, most of them uh, are going to vote for Clinton, uh, but some are going to vote for Trump. Uh, some some people are, are going to vote for Clinton because they think that Trump has a mental illness. Uh, <laughs> some people are going to vote for Trump um, because uh, uh, they feel that he's mean and vote against Trump because they feel that he's mean and they don't like to vote for mean people and others and I think most people say that um, Trump doesn't understand the social safety net and we here in Europe we need we are we are wedded to the social safety net we could yeah. not support a candidate who is not so what is your perception of how people in Europe not only in Brussels but all around how they feel about the American election Oh, this is so interesting. I mean, I am completely invested. I feel so American at the moment, you know. <laughs> I, uh, it's amazing. Me and so many of the Europeans I follow on Twitter that follow me, we completely go uh, so much, you know, um, energized by these elections, basically. Um, but that is the kind of uh, think tank journalist level, yeah? I mean, at the, at the local level, um, there are some who support Trump because they think uh, Trump understands, you know, the terror threat, which he completely doesn't. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's a joke. But, um, so of course, let me give you my perception and I'm literally mirroring uh, what a lot of my uh, colleagues think. Mm -hmm. uh, so, of course, Hillary Clinton is not the ideal candidate. Uh, she has a history of corporate, you know, shady uh, deals and uh, friendliness and that's not great especially from a european view uh it's not really socialist right mm -hmm. she's this corporate background so she's not ideal and more of most of all uh she's pushing 70 right i mean uh so she's not the young dynamic leader that like barack obama basically mm -hmm. um so that's one thing however she's the lesser of two evils i mean Trump started off, okay, as the Republican candidate and the perception of the Republicans in Europe is, you know, the nasty old party in a way. Uh, and it's not really great. And okay, it wasn't a big shock that they went for Trump. Uh, it's, and there were not other great candidates either, except for Jeb Bush maybe, but I think he was too soft compared to Trump. Uh, and too much of a gentleman, I must say now, which I'm shocked to say. But, um, so Trump, um, at some point, I myself said, okay, maybe Trump. Because, and the only reason I said that was um, because he was against intervention. And I think you don't need wars. You don't need to go out and bomb another country, which the U.S. is currently doing, by the way, in Yemen. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Oh, and exactly. Mosul, by the way, just just to add. Exactly, yeah. Okay, Mosul might, but Yemen is completely unnecessary in a way, you know. But honestly, I think that there should not be external intervention and wars and, you know, they should stop. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it, it's not that he has policy sense of, even though we've tried our hardest to kind of make sense and try to think he has some kind of policy, um, you know, an understanding of policy, at least if not some big strategy, but he doesn't. And since last Friday, I think he has no more supporters <laughs> left, except from the uh, misogynistic uh, uh, little minority that might be there, the openly misogynistic. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but otherwise, no, it's Hillary all the way now. Yeah, people have seen people have seen the debates. I take it, you know. I, I was in Portugal in, on the, one of the debates, and I, I, it was at 2 o'clock in the morning, but I was determined to see it. And I guess it was available yeah. throughout Europe. You could watch it if you wanted, huh? I did. I watched the current debate, the one which took place, uh, I think, a week ago. Yes, right. I, yeah, I stayed up at 3 a.m., and I was shocked uh, beginning at 2 a.m. when he did the presser with, you know... Uh, the women who were linked to Bill Clinton, and I was wide-eyed, you know, this is a reality show, it's no longer a U.S. presidential election, uh, and it's it's gripping, you know, it's, he's really turned it into something like the WWE, yes. and it's absolutely gripping, and, and his calls for um, both uh, candidates to take a drug test, I mean, it was crazy, and the SNL skit, oh my God, that was fabulous. Yeah. Well, it's an incredible, incredible experience, not only here, but in Europe, around the world, to see a demagogue of this, of this, uh, of this dimension um, actually deny things that are obvious that he did, obvious, and he denies it nevertheless. I mean, it reminds me of Huey Long in Louisiana back in the 1930s, if you know him. Anyway, I take it from what you say, Gary, that you will be voting for Clinton. Mentally, yes. Mentally, Clinton, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. <laughs> That's Gary Kondekar, Global Relations Farm in Brussels. She joins us every few weeks from Brussels in a show we call Midnight in Brussels. We examine what's happening in Europe and what they think of us. Thank you so much, Gary. We're doing it again, and we can talk some more about how Trump is doing that. <laughs>